it's an immense pleasure for me to uh, welcome you and greet you here in Geneva. Uh, to all of you that, first of all, to all of you who came from uh, all over the place, of course, from Switzerland, but also France, UK, Sweden, Norway, Algeria, Morocco, Jura, all, all over the world, uh, people are here uh, today. And um, uh, I want to, to also, before we start to thank the organizers uh, for their, the, the hard work, the dedication, and the, the, all of them are here. If you see them, thank them. They did a lot of work. Of course, I also want to thank the Sheikh Imran Hossein to, for the honor uh, and his friendship and to be here, of course, with us today. So, as we say in Switzerland, uh, bienvenue, uh, welcome in Schweiz, uh, bienvenue en Suisse, uh, benvenuti in Svizzera. Uh, and as, uh, as we say, as they say in France and in the UK, merhaba. Um, jokes aside, uh, the topic of today is very important. First, and, and I wanted to start to understand uh, who you are. We are about 320 people. And I would like to ask, in this room, who is a Muslim? Okay, a majority of people. Uh, who is a Catholic? Okay, a Protestant? Not so many. Um, Orthodox? Okay, a Jewish? No. <laughs> Buddhist? Or other Eastern religions? Uh, atheist? No religion at all? Or agnostic? Okay. So majority of Muslim. It, I want to ask because I believe it's very important and it's sad that we don't have all the representation that are possible. Um, because it's very important that we, we learn from each other, we discuss and we learn to be open-minded and discuss with, between ourselves without uh, the preconceptions that the media puts in our mind. So, what is the, the state of the world today? A few years back, uh, when uh, I started to realize that the world was not exactly as I, what I thought it was, yesterday evening at dinner we were, we were asking what was the precise moment, and for me the precise moment I realized that something was wrong in the world was when Colin Powell showed at the United Nations his little tube full of something uh, to justify war against Iraq. So it's about 10 years that I've been researching, and that's the material of my books, where, where we are today in reality. So if we take a step back, if you look at 10,000 or 12,000 years ago, in 10,000 before Christ, the population of the world was 5 million people. In the year one, year zero, in our calendar, population was 300 million in the world. When Napoleon was defeated in 1815, uh, it was one billion. So it took a lot of time to reach one billion people in the world. In 1920, we were already two billion. In 1970, we were four. In 2006, we were, in 2000, we were six. Today, in 2015, we're 7.3. United Nations estimate that in 2050 we will be 10 billion. All these people consume resources. We all consume resources. The poorest Africans or Indians want to consume the way Chinese do. Chinese want a house, not anymore a bicycle, but a car, a TV, and they want to consume like Japanese or Europeans do. The Europeans and the Japanese, they want to live like Americans. That means we consume resources at an increasingly high speed. Resources like oil, but of course minerals like copper, iron, aluminium, etc., etc. These resources are not infinite. They are limited. And therefore, the more we consume, the more there are people, the, the more we uh, unreasonably consume them, the more they become scarce, scarce. The result also of consumption is pollution and destruction of the environment. Often we believe that we live in a non-religious world, but in reality it is a religious world. We live in the religion of progress. And uh, it is believed that any progress is good. But 
how can we have progress and therefore grow? We cannot have infinite growth in a finite world. This, was, uh, this is not news. This is something that in the 1970s was already realized. But of course, we did nothing about it. So this is an important element to remember, that we are in a world that is, which, which, whose resources are being depleted. Now let's take another, another element. Who rules the world today? In 1945, the United States of America was 50% of the world industrial output. Of course, it helps that the rest of the world was leveled. Now, the United States of America and its parent corporations, to keep dominating the world and keep this dominance, have based their strategy on two big elements. First of all, perpetual war, which makes us joke with the shake that uh, Pax Americana has not a lot of Pax and is not really very Americana. And the second element is, of course, the, the dollar as the world reserve currency. So the United States was actually lucky to have a, a, the, the Soviet Union as a, a, an opponent because it could justify continuous war after the World War II. And Korea, Vietnam, all the wars in, in Latin America were extremely profitable for the military industrial complex that President Eisenhower denounced. And um, it was extremely valuable for the United States that the energy, which is mostly oil, could be bought with the dollar, and only with the dollar. The problem with war is that while it is profitable for a few industries and people, it is not extremely constructive and profitable for society. So the United States found itself in the late 1960s bankrupt. And this is why Nixon, President Nixon in 1971 decoupled completely, finished to decouple completely the dollar to the gold. And since the 19, 1971, the uh, United States has been living exclusively on debt. Remember that the only money that is valuable in the world is gold and silver. The other big problem that the United States started to face in the 1970s is that since 1970 precisely, we are discovering every year less and less oil. We have reached the peak discovery of oil fields in 1970. And it is very it is a coincidence, let's say, that um, the United States, uh, the Carter and Brzezinski doctrine uh, in the 1970s, refocused the strategic goal for the United States with the redeployment in the middle of the Cold War, the redeployment of three armored divisions from Germany to the Middle East, which obviously were used in the Gulf War in 1991. The 1970s, and of course, the realization that there was no more discoveries, no more new discoveries of oil, finished the process that started in 1930 to replace the United Kingdom to control the Middle East and, of course, Saudi, Iran. So war and uh, oil and the dollar are the ways uh, America controls the world. Unfortunately for them, after China and now Russia are back, because first of all, manufacturing from America has been outsourced into China. And so China became an economic, an industrial giant. And Russia is back as a military and an energy giant. And those two countries, Russia and China, are now allied and more and more economically integrated. The horror for um, maritime powers that were the UK and then the United States is to see a continental power. And what bigger continental power than Russia and China working economically and militarily together with Iran, with Brazil, with India, Venezuela, Ecuador, and many others. The United States and their, their owners are scared. They see that time is running against them. 
they cannot continue to keep their power in today's world. Every day, they are nearer and nearer an impossible bankruptcy. And yet, their current power makes them incredibly corrupt. Because, again, the military, industrial, and banking complex are not managed by free market. They are mar managed as a planned economy, as a socialist economy, a socialist economy for the rich and for the powerful. And when you look in the street, you see millions of poor people. 44 million Americans do not have a house, do not live in a house. Um, and that means the ideology, because I believe ideology is very important. The ideology of America is collapsing. And if the ideology collapses, if the economy is collapsing, if the country is in bankruptcy, if the military is decreasing, and the, the military capacity also is collapsing, what does it mean? It means that the biggest uh, economy and the biggest military power in the world is entering chaos. And this means it's very dangerous. Because this is not the army of Zaire. Sorry for Zaire, but this is, this is an army with 6,000 nuclear warheads. And I don't know you, but I don't like to have irrational people who are scared and irrational with 6,000 nuclear warheads. If the economy collapses in the United States, it means the economy collapses everywhere in the world. And such a collapse can have catastrophic consequences for people around the world, especially in the cities. Because we are relying on a very complex and efficient economy to get our food, our water, our medicine, our electricity, our transports. And when this is going to be missing, how are people going to react? In a world where people have been brainwashed, became stupid, because of television, because of consumerism, because of immediate gratification for every one of their pulsions and needs. I don't think they're going to react very well. So the long crisis we're in can become a very short, brutal, acute crisis very fast. So the, the leaders in, in America, and it's not Bush uh, and Obama, by the way, they understand that. And uh, they are panicking. And I also think they are very incompetent. Or maybe they're crazy. Or all of the above. But they know that time is running against them. And um, they, must, they must act. They must act to keep their power and to keep their dominance on the world. And so far, the only way they did that is to create chaos, to create war, to create tensions between people, tensions between uh, communities tensions between religions. And um, this is impacting us. Good friend and journalist uh, Pepe Escobar describes this process very well also in his book uh, Empire of Chaos. Because in chaos, people are scared. And when you're scared, you go to mommy. At mommy United States. Mommy dollar. So the United States is ready to kill millions of people so that they keep their dominance of the dollar and the control of the energy sources of the world. And again, my, my analysis is one that is very materialistic, empirical, and it does not preclude other analysis that we will hear in, in a few minutes. But it, also, but it does explain why there, is, there has been created chaos in Iraq in Libya, in Syria, and soon in many other places. And I believe soon here. So NATO, and, and of course, it's, which is the armed forces of America, really, go from one destruction to another, one disaster to another. And these Politicians, which are criminals, Sarkozy's, the Hollande, the Fabius, the Camerons, the Obamas, the Bush. Why are they not in jail? 
why are they not in front of the firing squad? After a failed trial, of course. <laughs> um, now we see this process moving into, into Europe. Because, to come back to what I said before, this cause does, has, does have an objective to also destroy Russia. Because again, Russia is a powerful military, has a powerful economy, and it is, and it is still the place where there is the most reserves of energy. And so it has to be destroyed, or at least controlled. If, but you cannot control Vladimir Putin. So you have to destroy the country. So that process started a long time ago with the wars in ex-Yugoslavia. But now it gets near Russia with Ukraine. And before that in Georgia and the Caucasus. But Russia is not Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Russia has indomitable people. 26 million dead in World War II to win the war. And they won. Russia is also a very sharp uh, in military indus industry. This is not uh, second-hand uh, export uh, tanks and planes and ra radar and anti-aircraft system that were sold to Libya or to Syria or to Iraq. This is cutting-edge te te military technology focused on defense. So anyone who wants to make war with Russia is, must be mad. Unfortunately, I cannot exclude that. So what we can, can we do? Can we, can we trust our politicians in Europe or in the Middle East or in America to change? For the vast majority, they are corrupt, incompetent, and as I said, sometimes criminal. Can we, can we count on the people? A lot of them still have television. But you in this room are part of the millions of people today who are changing, who are changing themselves, and then who are changing people around them, slowly. Unfortunately, slowly, but we cannot go faster because people are in denial. People want to continue to consume because it's pleasurable. The truth is hard. Whether it's, a, it's on a materialistic approach or, on a, or on, a, on a spiritual approach. But we can reinform ourselves, we can re-educate ourselves. We can learn, we can read, and then we can act. And my humble approach, my humble advice that I explain in my books is of course that we can learn to be autonomous, or as autonomous as we can. Because when we're autonomous, we can be independent, and maybe we can be free, at least free from the slavers that are around, and more and more of them. So I explain how to build a sustainable autonomous base, which are based on reaching autonomy for water, for food, for medicine and health, on energy, on knowledge, in defense, and in social communities. And this is how I met the Sheik. I was listening very interesting to many of the videos and of his speeches online. And I was surprised to hear that someone from a, such a different background, from an approach that, they are, that is spiritual, was very educated, can come from the study of Islamic eschatology to reach the same conclusions that I did in a purely materialistic approach. So we met, shared ideas, shared thoughts, and we agree on the, on the path. There are not a thousand ways to do it. Maybe there is a, 
a few materialistic approach to save our, our bodies, which humbly is only what I ambition to do. I cannot speak more than the materialistic approach. And, and of course, the Sheikh will talk you, will, will go further into other ways to save ourselves. And therefore, it is also important that we meet today all together because with understanding and with autonomy, we don't have fear. And therefore, when you don't have fear, you can build peace and you can build dialogue and you can maybe solve, maybe, the immense problems we're facing today. Because if we don't talk, and if we don't talk in peace, we will end up killing each other. And some people are just waiting for that because you make a lot of money out of people killing each other. And even if they are crazy, which I think they are, it doesn't mean they're not going to try. So my friends today, it is really with humility that, that I'm here and that I encourage all, all of us together to always dialogue. Do not overreact to the news because when the news shows us people in Syria beheading people with a knife, it's meant to make us hate each other. When the media show in people making fun of other people's religions, it is made for us to hate each other. I've had threats today. I've, I've received threats from, for this country. And they say, why are you talking to a Muslim? Muslims are invading Europe. Muslims are taking over the world. I look around me. I look at TV presenters, politicians. I look at the people which I pay taxes to. I look at the general of the armies of NATO. I don't see Muslims. It doesn't mean there are no problems. It doesn't mean we don't have uh, massive problems in which Muslim people are linked. But Islam is not my enemy. Islam is not uh, a problem per se. Maybe people who claim to be Muslim can misbehave and create problems. Yes. But always we need to discuss first. And remember that the other alternative to peaceful discussion is war. And history shows that the wars are getting harder with more death, more brutality, more savagery, and much less compassion than before. This is not Saladin or Richard Lionheart anymore. This is gas, uh, artillery, massive destructions on civilians and everyone. So in the end, the choice of our is ours. For me, for you, for everyone. Are we going to go the easy way, which is to, to follow our pulsions and listen to the media and, and go to war? Or we say no. I say no. And uh, that is what I hope that uh, we will all do. And with this, j'espère que c'est ce que vous ferez également. But everyone has its choice. Vous avez tous votre choix. So with that, I would like to leave the, the tribune to uh, the honorable, venerable Sheikh Imran Hussain. And um, which I must thank for writing the, the foreword of the Arabic version of, uh, of, my, of my book, which you have never had. So this is your copy for you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. 
And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers, on our father Adam, our father Abraham and Moses, on Jesus, and on his mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My learned friend, Piero San Giorgio, brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum and bonjour. Uh, I will speak slowly, even though we have someone to translate. Pour te faire comprendre, pour te faire plaisir. I hope we have some Russians present here. Yeah. I am truly happy to be here today in this room in which there is no more sitting space. And we have some of you standing because there are no seats. There are thousands, maybe millions, who are going to view this in different languages uh, around the world. But there are 320 here and we are very happy to be in your company today. I see the joy in your faces, I see the light in your faces, and I know we are in the company of those who love us. But it is a dangerous world, a world that is becoming increasingly dangerous for those who have the courage to proclaim the truth. For there are those who feel threatened when the truth is proclaimed. I'm happy to be in the company of Piero, who has the courage to proclaim the truth. And we do this today without fear of consequences. And the truth will resonate in the hearts of mankind whose hearts have not been brainwashed or corrupted. I'm particularly happy to have with us here those who are Orthodox Christians, because Orthodox Christians in particular, but not excluding other Christians, it seems to me that the Quran is pointing in the direction of friendship and alliance between Islam and Orthodox Christianity. And Russia today leads the Orthodox Christian world, and this is not to offend the Greek people. And so our topic, Islam, the petrodollar and Russia's tryst with destiny. The petrodollar is a subject located in international monetary economics. I studied international monetary economics down the road, Rue de Lausanne, at the Graduate Institute of International Studies here in Geneva. My professor was not happy with me. I will refrain from mentioning his name. But I challenged him every single day in the classroom. Because I had the Quran with me in the heart. And this is truth. And so he said to me one day, Mr. Hussein, you don't have to attend my class, you know. Just write the exam at the end of the year. Which meant, don't come back to my class. So I did not go back to his class. I wrote the exam at the end of the year, and I passed the exam. <laughs> Russia's tryst with destiny is a subject located in politics, in monetary economics, in war and in peace, and in Christian eschatology. I'm happy to be here in Geneva to dialogue with Swiss secular scholarship. And there is so much in common between Piero's conclusions and ours. Imagine my happiness two years ago when I went to Moscow. And at the State University of Moscow, I lectured. And sitting on my left-hand side was one of Russia's most eminent scholars of Christian eschatology. And he was astonished. There was so much in common between Islamic eschatology and Christian eschatology. And so tomorrow, 
I don't know exactly when, maybe tomorrow is a month or two or three months from now, we go to Athens. We go to Athens to dialogue once more with Christian eschatology. The announcement will come on my website. And then an invitation from the University of Belgrade. And they're waiting for me there to continue the dialogue. And so we are happy to see a coming together of all people who are in pursuit of truth and who are prepared to denounce falsehood and oppression regardless of the price we have to pay. Islamic eschatology is a brand new subject. So you not find many voices in the world of Islam using Islamic texts to analyze the petrodollar, to analyze the state of the world today. But before we turn to our Islamic eschatological view of the petrodollar and of Russia's tryst with destiny, let me turn to the modern West, the secular modern West. The German thinker and philosopher of history, uh, Frederick Hegel, is the scholar par excellence who has explained the philosophy of history of modern Western civilization. And what it says is the last is the best. And that all that came before modern Western civilization has been surpassed and superseded. All previous civilizations are now obsolete. They are moribund. They belong to the museums of history. And that includes Islam. That is the arrogant philosophy of history. But Arnold Toynbee, the British historian, politely deferred. And I would like to recommend his book, Civilization on Trial. He disputed this philosophy of history. Arnold Toynbee, Toynbee British historian, and the name of the book, Civilization on Trial. He disputed this philosophy of history because he was essentially Christian. He recognized a mysterious Western agenda at work to impose its dominion, political, economic, and otherwise, upon the world. He said, in his words, the land, the sea, the air, everything they want to rule. And because they want to do it by hook or by crook, he put the name of his book, Civilization on Trial. He discerned in modern Western civilization, at the heart of it, a claim to be the chosen people of the Lord Most High. That sounds like religion to me. That sounds like eschatology to me. We are the chosen people. And he also discerned a mysterious connection between an all-powerful modern Western civilization as the chosen people of the Lord Most High with an agenda that was mysteriously connected with the Holy Land. Islamic eschatology allowed us to see what Toynbee could see only dimly. Islamic eschatology has allowed us to see and recognize that which Toynbee could only see dimly, not because of any inadequacy on the part of Toynbee, 
but because it was too early to recognize the footprints that were being created by the arrogant West. Islamic eschatology is the study of the end time. The end time makes a distinction between the end of history and the end of the world. From the perspective of religion, history cannot end without the final and conclusive triumph of truth over all rivals, over justice, of justice over oppression. That is the end of history. The end of the world will come when the mountains will be like pieces of cotton wool and the earth will speak and will tell you who did 9-11. The end of the world will come when we will be resurrection, resurrected. And whether we believe it or we don't, we're going to have to stand up and answer for the life that we led. And the poor, the poor of the world cannot wait for that day to come. The reason why Europe is being flooded with refugees is because those who want to rule the world have decided that their strategy must be to rule the world of money. It's not happening by accident. And our seminar today directs attention to the world of money. Islamic eschatology could not emerge as a developed subject before the creation of the Zionist movement in 1897. It is since 1987 that events have continuously unfolded in the world which allowed the discerning thinker and scholar to connect the dots of history and to read history differently from what is taught in universities. With the Quran and with the word of the Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, we have discovered within modern Western civilization a stage-by-stage -stage progression to a goal that is located in the Holy Land. We have discerned, for example, and you'll find in my book, Jerusalem in the Quran, part of the story, that the mastermind who created modern Western civilization brought into being Britain as a ruling state with Pax Britannica, except that it wasn't Pax, it wasn't peace. It was blow, war and bloodshed. And brought into being the sterling pound as the first step of the process of ruling the world of money. But at the same time that he created Britain as a ruling state over the world, he did something also in the world of Islam. He created the Ottoman Empire to do what Britain was doing to establish his rule over the world of Islam. And some of you may not like this, but to do his dirty work for him. And it is time for Islamic scholarship to wake up and to recognize the essentially evil nature of the Ottoman Empire, playing a sinister role in sabotaging an end-time alliance between the world of Islam and Orthodox Christianity located in the Quran and prophesied by Prophet Muhammad Allah's blessings be upon him. That was the Ottoman Empire. And then came Islamic eschatology's recognition of stage two. There was a mysterious passage from Pax Britannica to Pax Americana. And the United States emerges as the new ruling state in the world. 
and the US dollar replaces the sterling pound. But in the same way that Britain had a mysterious link with the Holy Land, shall I remind you of the Balfour Declaration? Similarly, the United States had its naval string attached to the Holy Land. At the same time that the mastermind brought into being Pax Americana to replace Pax, America, Pax Britannica in an effort to rule the world, he also acted in the world of Islam to demolish and dismantle the Ottoman Empire and to replace it with something with more evil in it, the Saudi Wahhabi nation state. And now that the time has come for the sun to set on Pax Americana and for Pax Judaica to replace Pax Americana, and if you cannot connect the dots, you have homework to do. Similarly, Saudi Arabia is now destined for the garbage bin. But this has not as yet reached the political scientists. This is Islamic eschatology. And the mastermind has something even more evil than Saudi Arabia to replace it. It's called ISIS or the Islamic State, the bogus Islamic State. And of course, when we speak like this, our lives are in danger. We know who created ISIS. We know who is funding ISIS. We know who is providing the weapons. We know who has the state of the art videos to video their tips. And we know those who are using deception to throw wool in our eyes. But we proclaim the truth as we see it. And we say to them from Geneva, that you can kill a man, but you cannot kill the truth. This is our, this is our viewpoint from Islamic eschatology. As we read history and we anticipate tomorrow. A mastermind has created a civilization, a civilization which today has been hijacked by a people who have PhDs in arrogance. All must submit to them, including Greece. All must submit to them, including China. All must submit to them, including Russia. The governments in the world of Islam have already submitted. But China will not bend her knee, and Russia will not bend her knee. And the true follower of Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, will not bend his knee. It is arrogance. It is arrogance to seek to establish your rule over all of mankind using the petrodollar. It is arrogance to also seek to transform all the rest of mankind into carbon copies of yourself. Imagine my happiness when I went to Moscow and I saw so many beards. And when I lived in New York, I knew there was only one man who was allowed to have a beard. A big white beard. And once a year he comes, he comes in a rain, reindeer. Santa Claus is the only one allowed to have a beard. That's arrogance. Do you even want to rule my face? That if I have a beard, I cannot work in a hotel. If I have a beard, I can't work in the armed forces. If I have a beard, I can't be in the military. If I have a beard, I'm not civilized. I'm unclean. It's not just arrogance. It's also power being used to oppress. But one day the oppressor will bite the dust. But those who have hijacked modern Western civilization are also a people who are cunning. They have PhDs in deception. Malcolm X used to say, be careful. They will convince you that you are walking west. When in fact you are walking east. And our prophet said, Allah's blessings be upon him, that that mastermind comes with a river and a fire. The mastermind, of course, being the Antichrist, Dajjal. But his river is a fire, and his fire is the cool waters of a river. Whoever falls in his river will have his load of sins increased. Whoever falls in his fire will have his load of sins decreased. In other words, 
they take the road to heaven and make it look like the road to hell. And they take the road to hell and make it look like the road to heaven every night on television. Which is why Piero doesn't have a television in his home. Adam Rand doesn't have a television in his home. And when you go back home, you know what you do with your television. I want to finish my comments on modern Western civilization by saying one more thing. The Lord God has ordered punishment for a number of criminal acts. Cut off the hand of the thief. Not for stealing a mango, but if you cut off the hand of a thief today, the banking system will collapse because Islam, the religion, insists on a free and a fair market, that's all. It is this absolute commitment to a free and a fair market which does not exist anywhere in the world today and which is why Europe is being flooded with refugees, not because the refugees are bad people. You have destroyed the free and the fair market. And it is because Islam is absolutely insistent on the establishment and preservation of a free and a fair market that the Lord God has said, cut off the hand of the thief. But that's not the worst punishment of all. The worst punishment in the Quran is the punishment for something called fasad. Fasad is that which not only corrupts, but also destroys. It does not direct attention only to the individual, it corrupts the whole society. It corrupts the world. And modern Western civilization has PhDs in facade. And so now to conclude my comments on Islamic eschatology, we recognize Gog and Magog to be at the heart of modern Western civilization. That we now live in the world order of Gog and Magog and the mastermind using and exploiting Gog and Magog is Dajjal, the false messiah. And so my dear audience, I say you have some homework to do. If you are to get the eschatological view of the world today, you've got to study Gog and Magog. You've got to study the Antichrist. But it's not easy. You need a versatile scholarship. Traditional religious education is inadequate. Islam, Christianity and Judaism, all three religions, have an identical view of the end of history. They say the same thing, that history is going to end with the advent of the Messiah. The Christian and the Muslim view is that Messiah came, the son of the Virgin Mary. The Christian and the Muslim view is that the Messiah is coming back. And when he comes back, truth will triumph over all rivals in the world. And justice will triumph over oppression. The Jewish view is that the Messiah has not as yet come. But the Messiah is coming. And so there is so much similarity between these three religions. And there's also a mysterious connection with the heart of modern Western civilization. Let us now spend a little moment on methodology before we turn to the petrolala. The scripture has two kinds of verses, the Quran, the Bible. There are those verses which are plain and clear. They don't admit of different meanings. But the Lord God is infinite. And his word is infinite. You can't put a cap on the meaning. And so there is, in addition to the first kind of verses, there is a second kind. And these verses are to be interpreted. And eschatology is located, most of all, in the second kind of verses. How do we interpret scripture? The Quran speaks about the stars in the sky 
And they were not put there only as decoration. A wise God placed the stars in the sky so that the traveler in the desert or the mariner in the vast ocean would be able to look up in the sky to locate the direction in which he should travel. When the stars become lamps, only then can they show you the way. And so this is not schoolboy scholarship. You have to locate the connection between the stars. You have to understand the big picture to be able to read the stars. So you can't be a part-time scholar to be able to read the verses of the Quran. You have to understand how the verses are interrelated and interconnected with each other. And this brings me to Piero San Giorgio. You cannot connect the dots of history without insight. About a year and a half ago, he wrote to me. He was astonished that he used the root of secular scholarship. And after 10 years of research, he came to certain conclusions. Uh, who is this sheikh in Islam? Using Islamic eschatology and arrive at the same conclusions. It is truth. And when God sees in your heart, there is integrity. Whether you are Christian or you are Muslim or you are Jew, he can give you light in your heart with which to see. The Muslim can be blind and the Christian can have the light because there is integrity in his heart. And this one is not facing Makkah when he prays, he faces Washington. So I said to Piero when he visited me in Malaysia, I said, Piero, you could not have written this book. I asked for the, English, the French version, it's not here yet. This is the Arabic version. Uh, Surviving Economic Collapse. Please read it. And for the Arabic speaking world, we're going to look at this video. Here's the book in Arabic. He could not have written this book without insight. You cannot connect the dots of history without insight. Insight comes with light. Light which comes from God. It's not sold in a supermarket. Our Islamic eschatological view is that the petrodollar emerged as part of a master plan to hijack the world of money and then to use money to force the submission of all of mankind, including Greece, to the Western rule. Russia, with great courage, has decided to challenge that hijacker. And I hope that uh, Piero would spend some time later on BRICS. The challenge to the petrodollar has come from BRICS. And that is going to lead to war. And that war is going to be nuclear war. Now let us turn to Islamic eschatology. The Prophet said, Allah's blessings be upon him, that the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. And people will fight for that gold. And 99 out of every 100 would be killed. And so it will be a unique war in human history. Like no other war has ever been. Looks very much like nuclear war. And each one would say, I will be the one who will survive the war. So it's a guessing game. They enter into the war not knowing what is going to be the end of the war. NATO can put that in their pipe and smoke it. But the Muslims, or the, sorry, the believers, believers in the one God, must not touch that gold. Wrong methodology is to wait for a mountain of the metal to come out of the river. Right methodology is to recognize that this is symbolic language. It has to be interpreted. It could not have been interpreted before 1974. We don't have the time to take you to Bretton Woods. We don't have the time to take you to the International Monetary Fund. 
We don't have the time to explain to you the origins of the US dollar as the uh, international currency. Suffice it to say that there was a fig leaf of integrity attached to the US dollar that by international law it was redeemable in gold at the rate of $35 US to one ounce of gold. So if you had $35 and if you were a central bank, not Imran Hussein, you could go and knock on the door of Washington and say, Uncle Sam, I want my ounce of gold. That fig leaf disappeared thanks to France, thanks to a courageous, a very courageous French leader. I met with Dr. Mohammed Mahathir, the Malaysian former prime minister, and said to him, you were not the first, Dr. Mahathir. You were the second. The first was Charles de Gaulle, who stood up in the French National Assembly and denounced that monetary system as unjust and paid the price for it, of course. But after he resigned, the French government continued his policy of bringing US dollars and seeking to redeem them for gold until August or September of 1971 when the United States said, now this is too dangerous. They had printed far, far, far more paper than they had gold. Uncle Sam should have been sent to jail. That's fraud. But what Nixon did was to say, we gave our word, but we don't have to keep our word. It's called Pacta Sun Servanda in international relations. When you give your word, you must keep your word. But he took this international obligation and he tore it and threw it into the garbage bin. And from September 1971, the US dollar was in no man's land. If de Gaulle was still alive, perhaps he could have brought it down. Two years later, the war took place of 1973, the Arab-Israeli war. And the mastermind was on both sides of the war. <laughs> and as a consequence of that war, King Faisal of Saudi Arabia imposed an oil boycott on the United States. Most of you probably already know because you've been listening to my lectures, but they knew what would happen if that oil boycott was imposed. They knew. They wanted it. And when the oil boycott was imposed, get what happened to the price of oil? It rose by 400% because the US dollar collapsed by 400%. And the Arabs were smiling. They become fabulously rich overnight. It was at that time that Henry Kissinger pulled off the greatest stunt in human history. And an ocean of oil an ocean of oil began to function as a mountain of gold. Know that uh, this is not boasting on my part. You boast God takes away your knowledge from you. I know that I am the first to interpret it this way. I don't have as yet support from the world of Islamic scholarship, but I have hope for tomorrow. What Kissinger did was to convince King Faisal, who was very simplistic in his thinking, poor man, to violate Islam's commitment to a free and a fair market, to take the beautiful religion of Islam that had come from the Quran and the Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, and put it aside, and uh, to commit himself to sell oil for only US dollars. So they're no longer in no man's land. They're off the hook now. Then he had to convince the other Arab oil producing countries to do the same. And Kissinger was absolutely correct when he said to them, if you do this, you're going to become fabulously rich. And they did it. And in 1974, perhaps it was that OPEC came into being and formalized the institution of the petrodollar. Meaning that the US dollar no longer has any link with gold. The US dollar is now strong and powerful 
and in constant and perpetual demand because oil is the greatest commodity traded in the world market. You don't have to bother about a Charles de Gaulle anymore. Even the sky is not the limit. You can print as much as you want. You don't even have to have a printing press anymore. The American president can simply order the Federal Reserve to create seven trillion dollars with one piece of paper. Distribute it amongst the banks. And when the bank gets one trillion, he can now lend how many? Ten trillion. This is worse than abracadabra. It's called fractional reserve banking. And only a people, excuse my language, only a people who have the intellectual acumen of jackasses will fail to see the fraud. But not my audience here today. But when Morsi from Egypt, who is now being entertained in jail, when Morsi in Egypt signs an agreement with the IMF for a loan of four billion, then that piece of paper becomes money. If nobody borrows the money, it just remains thin air. But when you borrow the money and you sign an agreement, it now enters into the money system, which is what Morsi was prepared to do. <laughs> and so they don't need to print paper anymore. You now have digital money. You now have electronic money. The petrodollar allows the US dollar to fly very high. Yesterday it was de Gaulle who recognized the fraud and denounced it. Today it's Russia. And we say thank Allah for Russia. And China is standing firmly with Russia. And India has joined the club. And so has Brazil. And so has South Africa. And hopefully there will be others to join the club. And it's called BRICS. What BRICS has done is to recognize the fraudulent nature of the monetary system, the petrodollar monetary system. And to seek to offer an alternative that will give to mankind more monetary justice. Now we come to that part of the prophecy where they're going to fight over that mountain of gold, an ocean of oil underneath the river Euphrates is now functioning as a mountain of gold and that's the petrodollar. But they're going to fight over it, said the prophet. And that war is going to be a war unlike every other war in human history. Because 99 out of every 100 would be killed. Our opinion is that this is pointing clearly in the direction of the use of weapons of mass destruction. And therefore nuclear war. Why would the leaders of Britain and France and Germany and the United States and Canada and Australia, why would they want nuclear war? Why are they moving in the direction of war with Russia? Why? When they know that this war would result in mutual destruction. Don't they care for their people? The answer is no, they don't care for you. <laughs> They don't care for you. They don't care a fig leaf for you. And so nuclear war is coming. They welcome nuclear war because Pax Judaica cannot be established with the world as big as it is today. Israel is too small. And so the world has to be downsized. The world has to become smaller for Pax Judaica to be established. That is the sad, the sad reason. War is now inevitable. But is that the end of the story? Is it Russia's destiny to do what happened in the Second World War, 26 million 
the first world war again i think about 20 million always it was russia that made the greatest sacrifice of all and today russia is not afraid russia knows what will be the consequences of nuclear war but the russian profile is plain and clear as daylight rush russia is saying we are not afraid time of course is on the side of russia the longer they wait to attack russia of course with another 9 11 the better would it be for russia we don't have the time to take you to surat al kaf of the quran which takes us to the black sea the black sea is in the quran in surat al kaf and crimea is in the black sea and they never wanted they never wanted russia to have control over crimea before you were born, there was a war called the Crimean War, 1851 to 1853. And that war was fought to deny Russia Crimea. And then they created the Soviet Union. They did it. And in 1954, six years after Israel was born, Russia, the Soviet did, Union did something quite strange. The Soviet Union handed over Crimea to Ukraine. And the master plan was that Ukraine will join NATO. And then Russia will give marching orders, get out. But look at the story now. <laughs> Russia has, I didn't say Russia has claimed and taken, I said Russia has reclaimed Ukraine, I mean Crimea. And Russia, the naval nuclear power, is now exerting its influence and power all over the Black Sea. Which is why Turkey is crazy now. Turkey is going crazy now. We now come to the last part of my talk. The destiny of Russia. There is a lot in Christian eschatology which we still have to learn. My duty is to bring Islamic eschatology to the, to the table. The Quran speaks about a time when Jews are going to be displaying the greatest hatred and enmity and hostility for Muslims. But it's a schoolboy methodology to say the Quran is speaking about all Jews. The Quran is not speaking about all Jews. We just have to look at the prison camp called Gaza and we can see the visible sign of that hatred and enmity and hostility in Gaza. And the conscience of the world is showing their sympathy for Gaza. At the same time, says the Quran, that you find this Jewish hatred and enmity and hostility. And remember, we're not talking about all Jews. You will find another people who will display the same profile of hatred and enmity for Islam. And for Muslims. And they are a people whose foundation is based on blasphemy. And that is where modern Western civilization today is taking mankind. Everything that the Lord God has prohibited, they are permitting. The Lord God has prohibited homosexuality. I'm talking about the Lord God, not Washington. The Lord God has prohibited homosexuality. And when he destroyed God, Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuality, he destroyed him in a way that would send a message for the rest of mankind until eternity. That if you return to this, I will return with my punishment. And what they're doing today is forcing upon the governments to legislate for a marriage of a man with another man. And if you don't do it, your money is really going to be attacked. Your economy can be destroyed. This is uh, the unfortunate expression because black is a beautiful color. They call it blackmail. You have blackmail, you have Black Friday. They don't like the black color. <laughs> But Russia says no. And Russia has enacted legislation prohibiting homosexuality. 
and Eastern Orthodox Christianity is standing up against them. And so the Eastern Orthodox Christian world is not a part of your modern Western civilization. Your Eastern Orthodox Christian world does not have this arrogant agenda of imposing its rule on all of mankind. The Orthodox Christian world does not have the agenda of seeking to transform all the rest of mankind into carbon copies of itself. And so the Quran goes on to say that at the same time that you have this Jewish hatred and hostility, and you have that civilization founded on blasphemy, displaying the same war on Islam, you will find that there will be a people you will find that there will be a people who will be the closest in love and affection for you. And I hope Bosnia is listening. And Kosovo is listening. And Albania is listening. And Macedonia is listening. You will find that there will be a people who will be the closest in love and affection for you, who will say we are Christians. And that is because the Quran goes on to identify who are these Christians. It gives us three ways by which we can recognize. Number one, they still hold on to monasticism. The monasteries, the monasteries in Paris and Washington are now McDonald's hamburgers and Pizza Hut and bingo halls but the monasteries are returning to Russia and every Greek is proud of his monastery monasticism is still alive and powerful and strong in the Eastern Orthodox Christian world the Quran speaks and says something more it says that they are not and arrogant people. And then finally, the Quran identifies those Christian people in a chapter or a surah of the Quran named after them. They are called Rum. Rum. And the Quran says, Rum was defeated in a land close by, close to Arabia. So that eliminates Chicago. But the Quran prophesies that within a few years, they will reverse this defeat and become victorious. And on that day when Rome is victorious, you Muslims, and the Prophet is still alive at that time, you Muslims will be celebrating their victory. You can do what you want with your Salafi methodology. You cannot, cannot, cannot deny the truth. That when the Quran speaks of Rome, it was speaking about the Byzantine Orthodox Christian Empire. It was speaking about Orthodox Christianity. And Russia today is leading the world of Orthodox Christianity. Yes. And so it is Russia's destiny to eventually forge friendship and alliance with the world of Islam. That part of the world of Islam which does not turn in prayer to Washington. It is Russia's destiny to join with the world of Islam in a war which will, which will take place after the nuclear war. And so we have the good news for Russia. Are you going to survive the nuclear war? Yes. That war which comes after the nuclear war, or in Islam we call it the Malhama, would be the war which will liberate Constantinople. They don't want us to remember this. And so they have banished the word Constantinople from the vocabulary. 
And it is a criminal act today to use the word Constantinople in Turkey because they don't want you to remember what Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, has prophesied. The conquest of Constantinople comes after the Malhama or the nuclear war. And the conquest of Constantinople will take place on the basis of an alliance between Muslims and Orthodox Christians. Why Constantinople? Why not Washington? Why not London? You know that square mile that controls the world of money in London? Why Constantinople? The answer is connected with the Black Sea. The answer is connected with Crimea. There is only one possible explanation for a conquest of Constantinople. And that is that Russia will survive the nuclear war as a naval power. And the conquest of Constantinople will liberate the Bosphorus, will liberate the Bosphorus from NATO control. And so the Russian Navy can pass through the Bosphorus into the Mediterranean. And that's going to create serial, serious problems for Pax Judaica. I don't think we need to speak more on Russia's destiny. This is enough. We can conclude that it is more than just amazing that a man living in the desert of Arabia 1400 years ago, who never went to school, never went to university, could not read, could not write. Allah kept him that way who never traveled out of Arabia, never came to Geneva. <laughs> that 1400 years ago, he could prophesy that from underneath the river Euphrates will emerge a mountain of gold. And that people will fight for that gold. And the 99 out of every 100 would be killed. And then he warned us that we must not touch that goal. How should we respond to a monetary collapse? The scholar is sitting right here. <laughs> Piero, Piero has more expertise than I do. How do we survive not just economic collapse, but more specifically monetary collapse, which could be around the corner. Could be a year or two from now. Make sure you don't leave this hall today until we get some answers. All I can do is to take my head and join it with yours and ask Piero to join with us. How do we survive monetary collapse? How can we extricate ourselves from a monetary system that is digital and electronic? How should we respond to the day when governments no longer rule the world, but banks will rule the world? I leave you with these intriguing questions.